got my dice, got my board, everything's set, time for some bunkers and badasses. Oh, hello, and welcome once again to the Titanium Mine. Would you like to play? I've got a lot of cool classes for you to try out. At any rate, uh, before we get on to the game, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Oh, they actually play bunkers and badasses in that game as well. So, it may come as a bit of a shock. But I'm a big fan of the Borderlands series. I know I've never mentioned that before, but now I am. Big secret. And Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a bit of a spin-off project, because back in Borderlands 2, there was a DLC called Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep, one of the best DLCs that's ever been made, and definitely the best that the Borderlands series has ever created. In the DLC, Tina leads the Vault Hunters through the world of Bunkers and Badasses, and basically does this giant send-up of fantasy tropes and Dungeons and & Dragons. And it's great, and people loved it. And it added in some neat grenades that actually did, like, spells more than actually being grenades themselves. A lot of fun stuff. Great quests, fun juxtaposition from the regular game. It was so popular that it keeps getting referenced by people who are fans of the series, and eventually they realized, well, maybe we should just make that game. And Wonderlands is the attempt at doing that, and I would say a pretty good one at that. At the beginning of the game, Tina takes on these new characters that you're not really familiar with yet, Valentine and Fret, uh, voiced by Andy Samberg and Wanda Sykes, and they are going to be sort of like the voices that you continuously hear throughout the adventure along with Tina for the most part. Now the interesting thing is that Wonderlands does shake up a few of the mechanics of the game from your Borderlands. Like for instance, in Borderlands, you have specific characters that have specific classes. But in Wonderlands, they do something that I think people are actually going to enjoy. They let you customize and build your own character. Pretty cool, right? In fact, you get different classes that you can then decide to specialize in, and you later even get to choose a subclass. So for instance, I decided that I was going to be a Spore Warden, and the Spore Warden is sort of like a ranger, but has more of a mushroom theme. You get a little mushroom guy that goes along with you. And then eventually I got to choose a subclass, and I actually chose Stabamancer, although I did later change that because I didn't really like his functionality. But Stabamancer as a subclass allowed me to get uh, a big damage boost to my criticals, which I thought was going to augment Spore Warden very well. But then, after I completed the main quest, I was able to choose a different subclass, go back and reassign all of my stat points. And I found a class that lets you have a, a floating head that shoots, like, lasers at people. That's pretty great. This idea about mixing up your classes and then having a couple different lines of skills that you can pad out is very interesting. I think that it works out well for replayability. Uh, it also makes you encouraged to try different things. Each one of these classes has essentially an active skill, which might be a companion character or might help augment their spells or abilities. And then they also have two different active skills that they can choose between. Your active spells are essentially what action skills were in the main game. But then you also have something that replaces your grenades, which aren't any kind of grenade at all, but they're actual spells, spell books that you can equip to your character. And those function in a wide variety of ways. Some of them work a little bit more like magic missiles, some of them let you place hydras down on the field, some of them let you, you know, pull a meteor out of the sky. There's some, there's some fun ones. The legendary versions of the spell books seem to be taking a little bit of a cue off of, like, Dungeons & Dragons proper. There's one that I had gotten a couple times, actually, which uh, allows you to shoot a gelatinous cube out of people, and it creates, like, spots of acid on the ground. It's, uh, it's fun. 
Not very practical, but it's fun. The story starts with you taking your character that you have now made and going up against the Dragon Lord, voiced by Will Arnett, by the way. And Tina makes it very clear that you, you know, successfully defeated the Dragon Lord, but now we're starting a new campaign and ooh, maybe the Dragon Lord's back. And so you start in the, like, training area of the game, the, you know, glade that they put in front of you, and you learn the basic mechanics of the game. And you start to realize that if you're familiar with Borderlands 3, that a lot of these controls are going to make perfect sense to you. You can vault, you can slide, you can crouch, you know, you can do all of the doobly-doo. Uh, and that the weaponry is taken off of the uh, weapons from... Borderlands 3, there are just fantasy versions of a lot of them, but you have your, you know, essentially doll weapons, which are now Dahlia weapons, for instance, and they have the same quirks and functionality that you might have been used to in the previous game. The difference is that the weapons are fantasy-themed, so it's not just that they, you know, shoot bullets, some of them are crossbows, rapid fire crossbows or they're based off of like cannons or they uh, they have magic crystals in them that fire off elemental blasts with magic you know it's all themed that way you you get it right the basic gameplay though as you start to get further into the game is very similar to Borderlands 3 and if you have played that game at all this is going to be very easy for you to pick up and play. But the theming of how they did all of your equipments and your weaponry and the enemies and everything like that has changed. One of the other things that they introduced very early on that is a new thing to Wonderlands is you get a melee slot. So it's not just that you have a melee attack immediately assigned to your class, but that there is a slot for your melee weapons, and you get to unlock them like you would guns, and find ones that have a speed and damage and abilities that might suit your playstyle the best. That's a neat change, and allows for a lot more customization in how you do melee combat, especially if you are one of the more martial classes in the game, like the Berserker. You might want to... Uh, be very focused on what you equip in that slot, so some good customization there. You find out about the Dragon Lord, you find out that, uh, you know, he's, he's back, and you get into the wider world, by which I mean the overworld. And this is another big change that Wonderlands does over previous games, is that there is this overworld that you go to, a hub that connects all of the individual maps that you go to. In previous Borderlands games, you would simply transition from one map to another, but they do this fun thing where they have this overworld now, and you get to go across this landscape that was obviously made by Tina, uh, that features, like, Coke cans and stuff that create rivers of liquid and bottle caps that you can knock down in order to create shortcuts back to previous areas, uh, popcorn that creates, like, mountains and rocks and stuff. It's a very interesting idea and uh, really kind of lends itself to the sitting around with your friends playing Dungeons & Dragons feeling of the game that they're trying to ingratiate themselves with. You'll eventually get to the Kingdom of Brighthoof, and you will get into, like, the main storyline, where the Dragon Lord proves to be really bad. And then, after that, you start to get the impression that Tina may be losing her grip on the game, and that the Dragon Lord is a little bit more than what he originally appeared as. And I have to say that by the end of the game, even though the Dragon Lord felt like kind of a cardboard cutout of a villain by comparison to, like, Handsome Jack, but by the end, I thought that what they did with the Dragon Lord was far more interesting, and without really giving anything away, explains a lot about the very interesting, you know, pseudo-relationship that players will have with characters in a role-playing game. 
that these characters that you interact with only on a page uh, start to take on a life all of their own. And in fact, a lot of the game feels like a love letter to D&D and other role-playing games. It doesn't feel as much of a criticism. The characters are seen in positive lights, they're having a lot of fun, uh, and all of the characters that you're used to from the mainline series come back in wonderful new forms in this game. Uh, you have uh, Brick coming back as the fairy punch father. He's great. Uh, Mr. Torg is a bard, because of course he is. And you get some uh, fun cameos along the way as well. But in general, the themes and the characters that you're used to from the Borderlands series are well represented in this. One other thing that I was really surprised by, pleasantly I might mention, is that there are entire maps of the game, entire areas of the game, that are only unlocked because you chose to take on a side quest that led you there. Like, if you wanted to go straight from beginning to end, do story only, there would be three or four complete maps of content you would not even hit. Which is pretty incredible because it means that those that want to explore will get a lot more content out of the game. And in fact, when I originally tried like a free trial of the game, I thought that it was a lot shorter than it actually is. It is actually much, much larger than that initial area before you travel across the seas. There's a whole thing where you're supposed to get a boat together and travel across the ocean, and I figured that that was just going to lead me from that initial area that I had explored right to the Pyramid, which is like the Dragon Lord's big temple off in the distance, only to find out, uh, no, I, I actually, now you have a giant journey to get to the Pyramid that you have to go through. Uh, which was a, a pretty pleasant surprise. There is one quest, for instance, in the overworld where you have a magic bean that wants to get planted, and you can take the magic bean to the place that it wants to get planted, and you find out that this magic bean is kind of evil. And then you plant the magic bean, and it erupts and just, like, takes out a town that is now just up in the sky in a magic bean pole. And that allows you to access a brand new map, which is this city in the sky that has now erupted from this bean. And not only do you have the quest to defeat, like, the bean that <laughs> wanted revenge on this town, but there's, like, half a dozen quests that are specific to that area that you also get to do while you are there. There's, like, a full map of content. And there are other places in the game that are only accessible because you chose side quests that lead you there. Because otherwise, you probably wouldn't have gone there at all. Overall, I was impressed that it was as long as it was, but it is not without some critiques. Um, the first one is that after you've completed the game, you unlock like these chaos arenas where you go through you know, one arena of enemies, and then you get to choose if you want to have upgrades or if you want to, you know, get some better loot, some better prizes by taking on bigger challenges. But they don't have the mayhem levels that you would have been used to from Borderlands 3 because that would have allowed me to go back and, you know, maybe farm different bosses for some of their special gear at higher levels, uh, going back maybe and doing the quest line again. But in absence of any of that, uh, the way that you mostly get that loot again is either through a vending machine, if you're lucky, or you can go into the chaos arenas where you just fight a bunch of bad guys and then go to the next arena where you fight a bunch of bad guys with more difficulty, et cetera, et cetera, as time goes on. And it works, it works, but it's uh, not really as engaging as the main areas of the game are. Uh, the other thing that's kind of part of that is 
that there's a lot of random encounters and other little battle arenas that you get into throughout the game. Uh, it will go into a specific arena, the, the screen will like crack around you, you go into this world, and you have a bunch of skeletons or, you know, bandits that you have to kill off. And uh, you do that, and then you go to another one and another one, and then you get, like, a shrine piece. And you collect the three shrine pieces, for instance, four shrine pieces. Uh, you put them on the shrine, and then they give you, like, some gold. Like, okay, that was that was great. You know, I unlocked all the shrines. I, I did, like, all of the side content, and so I, I saw a lot of the game. But I did feel like that wasn't as... Um, fleshed out as I would have liked it to be, and definitely a downgrade from the Mayhem levels of 3, which totally change up the entire game world, and you can go to all of these other areas where you can uh, see what the different modifiers actually did to the game. And I think the other big problem that I see with Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is just that Gearbox seems to be treating it like a side project and not one of their mainline titles, even though it was priced as a full price title. The reason I say that is because, one, it did have several pieces of DLC, but I didn't even bother picking up the DLC because it was so badly reviewed. And the reason why it was badly reviewed is because they're very small, contained, short pieces of content. Not nearly what the previous series would have given you for additional content. The fact of the matter is that it just seems like they didn't do a very good job with supporting the game with the additional content. And I don't see any talk about real full-fledged story missions and content uh, coming out in the near future, or ever. And also, this is seemingly deep in the weeds, but shift codes. Shift codes have been a thing for the Borderlands series for a very long time, and have been a good way for Gearbox to promote, you know, seasonal outfits and, you know, skins, but also special weaponry and stuff like that. And of course, golden keys for the chest. And there is a chest in Brighthoof that allows you to use golden keys for special gear, but the amount of shift codes that I found for Wonderlands when I was on uh, totaled one. There was, there was one shift code available that was still working, and it was from like a month beforehand. That's not great. I remember Borderlands 3, and 2 for that matter, uh, having shift codes, even now, I, I bet if I looked up shift codes for Borderlands Three and Two, now there are new codes for those games. There, there are there are recent codes for those games because they did support them for such a long time. It feels like Wonderlands, even though I think it was a great framework and a great idea, and I would like to see a sequel, kind of got shafted in terms of the studio supporting it long term. And that doesn't fill me with confidence, because I always thought of Gearbox, especially with this series, wanting to support it long term. Not just giving you a great game out of the gate, which I think that they did achieve, but really having an interest of continually adding to the game. There were several iterations of the Mayhem levels in Borderlands 3, and then they had the raids that they put into place afterward, lots of different seasonal content, and that went on for years. Wonderlands has been out for about a year now. None of it. Just none of that kind of stuff. And it's a shame, really, because I think that they have a gold mine on their hands. There are people who didn't like to play a specific character and wanted to play their own character. I would have really liked, even though you can have a voice for your character, if your character's name appeared in, like, the subtitles and stuff, instead of just saying player, little nitpick, something that they could probably fix pretty easily. But the point is, is that it gave you a more customizable and personal experience for the player and really let you play around with a lot of different options. And I think that it has 
a lot of great stuff that people are going to enjoy, especially if you like the looter shooter. And for them to sort of just then you know, seem to shuffle it off to the side makes me a sad, sad boy. But I do still like Wonderlands. Uh, they have it on sale quite frequently, and I would suggest doing that. I wouldn't worry about picking up the DLC. I did not see much of value in it. There is one that apparently unlocks another class, and if you were going to get anything, I guess get that. But I, I didn't really see a reason to uh, to buy it. Too much for what they I know they are. I don't really have a different recommendation to Wonderlands uh, because everything that I would normally tell you about is just the Borderlands series, and I do like the Borderlands series writ large, as I've said in the past. Um, I do typically like two the most, although I was actually very happy that they got rid of the slag weapon damage system. I, I thought that that just threw the balance of the game off quite heavily, especially when you get to, like, ultimate vault hunter mode, because you have to keep slagging enemies consistently in order to do any kind of damage to them, and then keep switching to another weapon, which is just, um, a lot, a lot of weapon maintenance. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, if you like this kind of game, I would just suggest playing Wonderlands. You, you might as well. It does it better than... Other games in the category, great. Well, now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can finally play Bunkers and Badasses. Except I'm actually realizing Bunkers and Badasses isn't a game I have in front of me. It's just a keyboard. I'll do better next time. It's gonna be a cool campaign. The Dragon Emperor is gonna be the 